Welcome to Allergy Dragons Lair Podcast. My name is Martha Morgan. I'm a specialty diet and allergy chef. It happens to have celiac disease, a couple food allergies, but my biggest claim to fame is raising a child with over 30 food allergies. Before we get to the topic of this episode and I introduce my allergy friend, let's do a quick disclaimer. So the views expressed here on our show are the personal opinions and life experiences of ours and our guests. We are not healthcare providers or doctors. Please seek advice from your healthcare professional for any diagnosis or changes to your health care plan. End of disclaimer. So I have got a very special guest, and I know, I know, I say it all the time, but I really mean it. I do need to come up with something else special, but you know. So Gail from Allergy Force happens to be uh, on here with me today, and we're going to be talking about why we think it's important for kids to get into the kitchen. So Gail, can you introduce yourself real quick for some people who may not know you as one of my best allergy friends? Hi, so, so glad to be here, Martha. Thank you so much for for having me on as an allergy friend. For those of you who don't know me, I am CEO and co-founder of Allergy Force, which is a, a food allergy app, as well as an educational resource for families who are managing food allergies. It was inspired by our son because I also happen to be a food allergy parent. Not only a food allergy parent, but a really long time food allergy parent. So with 20 plus years of experience, navigating a lot of different types of situations. That's who I am by working with Martha on this is to help people live a little easier, live with more confidence and learn from our lived experience. Okay, Gail, let's get started then. So why? Why should all kids, but especially kids with food allergies, you know, be in the kitchen? What What do you think is the biggest reason why? Oh, I think there's so many reasons for kid, kids to be in the kitchen in general, but particularly kids with food allergies or other dietary restrictions. Just to, to name a few reasons specifically for food allergy kids, it teaches them a lot about their diagnosis, learning to touch food, work with food, learning what food's safe versus what food's not safe. So there's a lot of elements about learning and coming to grips with the entire diagnosis because you know, not everybody's just allergic to one thing like peanuts or soy. I mean, many kids out there have multiple food allergies that they're dealing with and the list can get even longer if they're dealing with things like EOE or f which also include, you know, multiple trigger foods and things like that. So it gets pretty complicated. So anytime you get them in the kitchen, learning about food, learning about what food is in the kitchen that's safe for them is really a benefit. A second reason for them to learn, and this is a longer term reason, but when they understand their diagnosis and they understand kind of the ins and outs of making food, ingredients that might be in different types of recipes or different types of foods that they like, it prepares them later on to be better self-advocates for themselves because they'll be prepared to ask questions. Like, how is this prepared? What's in it? And so you start planting the seeds for self-advocacy very young by getting them in the kitchen. Third really important a survival skill when you have food allergies or other serious dietary restrictions is food label reading skills. And so it's so beautifully incorporated. It's just part of the flow when you get kids cooking in the kitchen to look at labels, you know, even shopping to for the recipe that you're going to prepare and, and making choices at the grocery store that you'll come back and use in making a recipe. Um, that food label, label reading skill is is essential. I mean, that's a lifetime skill that they'll need to master. And again, it's not mastered overnight, but it gives them real-time practice when they're cooking in the kitchen. And then a fourth reason to get them in the kitchen is that it fosters social skills. Like there's a lot of teamwork and collaboration that goes on in the kitchen. You know, you can create a play date around baking something, you know, so it can start very young. And then as they get older and more independent, I mean, kind of driving forward to latter middle middle school or into high school, you know, they could invite friends over and host them and prepare, you know, snacks or meals for them. But it, it becomes um, a very, uh, a basis for socializing because so much socializing happens over food. So if you know how to prepare the food, you know how to control the environment in your situation and you can stay safe while being social. So those are my reasons for getting kids in the kitchen sooner rather than later. And I would say ditto on all of that. So I think, yes, the number one reason to get kids, period, into the kitchen 
is to know where their food comes from and how it's prepared. For example, I'm a very example person. When you were talking about teenage years, creating food themselves and having friends over, many times they, we had like friends giving and Vesper started that. For those who don't know, that's my youngest kiddo with over 30 allergies. And they started doing friends giving and all their friends would come over. I would be not in the kitchen and they're 16 years old. If they needed help, I'd be around, but I would not be cooking the meal and friends would help. And they would ask questions on why they can eat this, but why they could eat that. And then they would sit down and it was in a controlled environment and they created the whole entire meal. So they were empowered, they hosted and they educated their friends and it wasn't stressful for them. It wasn't stressful for me. And, you know, they even cleaned up after themselves. So that was good. And I got to eat. So yeah, exactly. Everything you talked about, just piggybacking it on it, basically, and reinforcing it is the reasons why you should have your kid get into the kitchen. And then another thing with it being the life skill is that it also, they learn and they don't even realize they're learning. You know, it affects everything, math skills and processing skills, fine motor skills. So from little to, you know, adults that it really does, they learn every single time they're in there. It's science, it's chemistry. If I could jump in and I was thinking, you know, sometimes you're so in the moment, so in the present when you're parenting, it's really hard to pick your head up and think about like the long-term future. And so it's, it's a very gradual build of skills. It's just living life and accumulating experience through life. But long-term, you really are trying to prepare your kids so that they can live independently and not be hungry mm-hmm. <laughs> and eat safely, <laughs> nourish themselves properly. And so it's just like incremental building blocks that you take over time, right? To teach them some skills and build on those skills and build on a little bit more so that by the time they're living on their own, you know, they're, they're not going to be, you know, living out, out of a microwave. They'll actually have some culinary skills to nourish themselves and, and fuel their bodies in a healthy way. And I think that's super important. With any kid, it makes them want to try food more if they see how it's made and prepared or if they had their hand input making it. Like you said, it's so hard sometimes to see the benefits because we're living day to day and we're like, oh, it's easier for me to make this without them. And I think it's really important, especially when kids are really young, to really make sure that you schedule some time that you're going to have with them in the kitchen. Get them in the kitchen and doing easy things. And it's just as important to take the time to kind of play in the kitchen. I know we spend time with our kids, but that's another form of play is is learning how to cook. I think that you touched on a really good point is that um, it's really important to keep it light and fun and not make it a chore. So one of the ways my family you know, made it kind of fun, and this is less cooking and more assembly, but was a make your own pizza night, right? And so we, we kind of um, cheated a bit on the dough. <laughs> and so we purchased the, the dough, the raw dough. <laughs> but then it was like a, a topping step. You know, how do you want to dress your pizza? And then it was like kind of fighting with the oven to get it the right temperature. And it was great fun because we came together as a family to create. And it was a bit art and a bit fun. And, you know, just learning about different textures and different tastes that would go together. And, you know, and, and so that, you know, you can inject an element of fun. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't ever want it to be positioned as a chore, you know, because it, it is, there's, cooking is fun. Food is beautiful. And it's, fun it's very tactile thing to get your hands involved with, with some of the textures and the smells and the flavors yeah so so I highly recommend it family pizza night <laughs> oh I think so too I think that's awesome so I think we kind of gone over like why our kids should get in there so the how-to there's so many different ways and concepts you can get your kids into the kitchen which really honestly benefits you in the long run I've heard a lot of people say like I can't get my kids to try vegetables and that kind of thing. And they're buying the vegetables. And I'm like, sometimes, you know, if you take your kids with you and they start going through the vegetable aisle or the fresh fruits, or if you go to a farmer's market, that's where is allergic to quite a few fruits and vegetables and a lot of preservatives. So we can't really buy a lot of things that are pre-made or canned or that kind of thing. So one of the things we always would do is we would have the kids try to pick something out of the farmer's market or fresh produce or that kind of thing that, they wanted to try what looked interesting to them. It really makes them, I think, 
more open to try the vegetables. So that was what we did. What kind of things did you do to get them in the kitchen fairly young? Kind of going back to making it fun. And I think of it as kind of ages and stages. When my kids were really little, I put them in the high chair while I was baking or cooking or something. And I just talk to them and tell them what mom's doing. And then, you know, to get them in the spirit of the thing, I might give them a little plastic bowl and a little wooden spoon to let them stir when I'm stirring or you know, give them some measuring spoons to, to play with. And so when they're even very little, little, you can kind of get them involved, give them plastic measuring cups to play with or an, an empty season, you know, a seasoning like a empty garlic powder or, you know, seasoning container that they can pretend to play with. And so, you know, there's there's lots of ways, even if you, you know, were grilling outdoors or doing something outdoors, that we would small tub of water on the ground, not very deep, and of course under supervision, but we give them measuring cups to measure the water back and forth. So there's lots of little things you can do just to, you know, because they, like, they, they, they watch you, you know, and they learn from watching you at this very, young age. And so really talking them through and including them in your process is is a great way to start. Age appropriateness is extremely huge. And so you kind of, I think what you did was amazing and great because it makes them get used to like, I can do this and I'm doing the same thing as mom. And it helps develop those fine motor skills without pushing them before they're really ready. And like you said, assembly things before assembling things just as easy as sandwiches or assembling their lunches when they start to go to elementary school for the whole week. And then you can get them set up into the kitchen so it makes it easier for you. Definitely gradual. And it's definitely, it needs to be uh, designed or handled in a really age appropriate way um, because there are risks, as you, as you point out, of them you know, eating something that could make them sick when it's raw. And so you know, I, I was addressing kind of the, the very early, like 12 to 24 months, but ages three to five, that's a really fun time to get them going in the kitchen. I mean, I still have vivid memories of my little three-year-old standing on the step stool next to me or on the kitchen chair, actually, you know, stirring away when we're trying to make cookies. I, I'm just speaking really as a, a food allergy parent, but mm-hmm. definitely giving them spoons. Um, another fun thing to do is get them a special apron. Um, so that when you're going to cook in the kitchen, you you, you know, we got to put our apron on, you know, so it, it makes it a little bit fun. From three to five, I mean, they can help you like add ingredients, so, you know, they can, they're steady enough with back to the small motor skills development, but with the help and guidance, they can, they can add the, measure the ingredients or, you know, put spoonfuls of the baking soda or baking powder or whatever you have to add. Um, another great project to get them involved in is if you work with yeast and you're, you're making a, a type of bread product, just the kneading, the kneading process and letting it raise. I mean, kneading is a great, great thing for them to get there <laughs> to, to work the dough and everything. So there's, there's lots of opportunities. You have to think about the cooking process in terms of little chunks, bite-sized pieces, and you chunk it off, you know, and you assemble your crew in the kitchen and each of them has a tiny chunk. Of, of the bigger process to put a meal on the table or to build, create a baked good or something like that. Three to five is a really fun age to even like, you can get them a butter knife. That's what we did. But I would give my kids like mushrooms, things like that, that were easy to chop. So they can even start doing some, some chopping, you know, from five to, you know, seven ish, like three to four, they, they might be able to cut some strawberries with it or, or depending what things that they're not allergic to. And so the, that was one of the things that we always did too, was they gave them a little knife and like I said, not a sharp knife. Yeah. And, and when I was growing up, we had a very archaic uh, kitchen tool and it was like a kind of a plastic ball that had blades tucked up inside of it. And you would hit the top of a, a little handle mm-hmm. um, that would make the blades go down. So you'd put the, the plastic bowl over whatever you were ever going to chop. And then you would hit the, hit the top. So like a manual chopper. Top. Yeah, yeah okay. it was a manual chopper and it was like so safe. And, you know, that's definitely something, I mean, again, softer foods, so it doesn't require a lot of force, but it could help them chop up little, little bits and pieces when they're in the, you know, the four to five, five-year um, age range. One of the things I did want to bring up though, that I think is really important, and I think you have to start it really young, is to to create a hard and fast rule 
that you start with a clean kitchen and you end up with a clean kitchen. And so if there's like disarray or, you know, dirty things in your kitchen, before you even start cooking or start a project, you make sure that kitchen's cleaned up, you know, so you have clean working spaces. And then you also get them involved in the washing and drying and of all the tools and things that were used so that you leave the kitchen clean when you finish. And that's something that you start really early. It just becomes a habit. And so I can't stress that enough to kind of foster that habit. Clean kitchen at the beginning, clean kitchen at the end. I agree with that. That's definitely something you have to start early on. Now going into like your your grade school kids, they really kind of get start to get excited. So I think Vesper was about seven when they ended up getting a cookbook. Of course, there was not any allergy cookbooks out at the time. Uh, their grandmother got it for them. And it was a Paula Dean kids cookbook. And I was so impressed with them starting to read it. And like, there was something in there for peanuts or peanut butter. And it was like, well, I can't eat that. So I'm going to have to use and wow butter was out and we don't have a soy issue. So it was like, well, I can use wow butter instead. And like, they were already starting to interchange things in that little cookbook. And they were picking out recipes. So I think from six to eight is a great time to start looking at cookbooks together or and looking at things like that and having them really kind of pick things out. Totally agree. I think my um, two of my kids were, uh, I have twins, so they're younger. They, they do not have food allergies. It's my oldest who's four years older than the twins who has, has the um, multiple food allergies. But when my twins were, in about, I think about second, third grade, we were looking for a summer activity and there was a school enrichment program. And there was this dynamic duo of really fun teachers. It was our science teacher and our music teacher, they were two guys. They, were, they got together and they taught a, 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 taught a cooking class to little, like, little kids. Um, and both my kids got so much out of that cooking class. They assembled a little binder of the recipes that they made. They would come home and practice making the recipes. They learned so much in this like week long enrichment program (laughs) by this crazy science teacher and really fun music teacher. And they will never forget that. And I think there's offerings like that, cooking at the local Y or through the parks and recreation departments and things, but just even giving them a little summer campus experience, you know, with a little cooking class or something can, can also be a way to whet their appetite for, for getting involved in food and, and making yummy stuff. Yeah. And just to throw it out there, allergy dragons. Uh. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah, a setup I, there, Martha. <laughs> that was a setup. It was a purpose setup. Good. Good to know. Uh, yeah. Just so everybody knows that, yeah, I do offer classes online and I do like a lot of hybrid cooking classes during the summer that have kids involvement and I do have kids that and it's online and we cook you know they're cooking from the comfort of their home with their parents and we try to make them as age appropriate as possible and so a lot of people will message me and ask questions so you can do it virtually but if you can't you know get to some place that is safe for you because that does become a, an issue too when we're talking about you know cooking classes is can they accommodate you for your allergens yeah. Uh, and I think that's like the hardest part with cooking, with, with cooking school. So anyway, so shameless plug, um, allergy no, dragon. It, it, definitely. Like these virtual classes that you give Martha are amazing. Um, I, I had a chance to take a look at a, an egg substitute class virtually because you're in Louisville and I'm in New Canaan, Connecticut. And so you know, I wasn't exactly going to get to the rainbow market to, to take your class. So I would have loved to have had it in person. Another thing too is just to be mindful about encouragement and praise. Like things happen in the kitchen, stuff gets broken, that stuff gets spilled, you know, there's whoopses that happen all throughout the cooking process. So, you know, keep it light, keep it fun, be encouraging, you know, praise where appropriate. Um, But I think it's just that positive encouragement, like bringing positivity into the kitchen to, to really nurture this, um, love for cooking or passion for cooking in your kids is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think that also then brings about less negativity about their allergens as well, because we're talking about what you can eat versus what you can't. And everybody makes mistakes. 
you know, it's just part of life. And so I think, yeah, positivity is so important. So I would think so, like we're talking elementary school and middle school, you know, because those are really like formative years and everything. And I, I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier or referred to earlier, it's like, you know, kids when they're cooking are getting math lessons and they're getting chemistry lessons. The need to substitute for ingredients is a huge lesson in chemistry, you know, because you're trying to figure out what's going to have the right list or what's going to make something moist or, you know, so how are you substituting? And, you know, you get from an egg to, to that gives lightness and airiness and moisture to maybe applesauce or bananas or tofu or, or egg replacer powder, you know, and so it, it's definitely a chemistry process or lesson in chemistry to try and figure out substitutions. But I would start tackling kind of the substitution, the, the can work around, like you want to make X, oh, it has this allergen in it. Well, what can we do to make it work for you, right? Like the soy butter versus the peanut butter. You know, I think that's really um, great lessons to be had in the kitchen when you're trying to figure out how to make a recipe that tastes like something that you might not necessarily be able to eat. Another example, never have been able, my son's never been able to go to a Chinese restaurant. There's just too many of his allergens there. It's too scary. You know, got a cookbook, <laughs> an, an allergy-friendly cookbook on Chinese food. And, you know, we've kind of worked through, like, what role could nutritional yeast play in it? And, like, what are different types of, of things that you could substitute, you know, mimic a, a flavor that's really unique to the, that, that culture's cuisine? You know, starting the whole substitution conversation early is, is you know, perfect for age six of when they're through middle school. When we're talking about substitutions, it's problem solving skills. And I think that that translates to regular life as well. So I think it does build confidence with food allergies and without, you know, just the general things of life. I think it's important when you manage food allergies or other types of, of dietary restrictions to really kind of approach with can thinking. How can I make this work? How can I do it? How can I work around the obstacle that's going to block me? Because there are many workarounds. Just have to be a little creative, right? And always stay in your lane for being safe. You know, approaching it with a can instead of a can attitude is huge. It's definitely a huge mindset. And yeah, and you can change it in the kitchen. So with middle school and high school, you know, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit. But what do you think are the biggest house because now they're, they're able to kind of, you know, start to do things on their own, not everything, especially not yeah. middle school. So how do we start to transition and to be able to walk away as parents in the kitchen? Yeah. Again, I think it starts in the earlier years where you're giving safety lessons along with the cooking lessons. I mean, just, you know, teaching them to be mindful about working with sharp knives, you know, basic kitchen survival skills. <laughs> like what to be aware of and how to make sure the burner's off and, you know, making sure they heat the right level and not consuming your pan <laughs> in, a, in an inferno or something. You know, I think the way you kind of transition to more independence in the kitchen is, you know, maybe you figure out a recipe that you want to try and then you don't inventory it to see if you have what you need to make the thing. You, you have them, you send them on a mission, a scavenger hunt to find out if they have the ingredients. And if there's not, then you help them create that shopping list and you take them to the store and send them on the hunt in the store to, to find what they need to make that recipe. So it starts, you know, you start, it's not all magically coming from the pantry. They have a sense of really what it takes to prepare a special item, like from the figuring out what you need, what's missing, to going to source it, to bringing it home to be so you can work with it. And so I think, you know, middle school is a great, you know, ladder, like late, late elementary into middle school, tr trying to help them break down recipes and figure out what's missing. It's also like that incorporates label reading too, because when you're on the hunt at the grocery store, you have to read the labels. And, you know, by middle school, end of elementary, end of middle school, they should be reading just fine and have those reading skills. And it's just having that habit to they never put something in your shopping cart if you, you see an allergen on the ingredients list. So um, another thing that's really fun, and I did this in the la latter middle, middle school part, was I designated um, my kids to become expert in a, a recipe or a food. So my um, guy with the allergies, he is our chocolate chip cookie expert. He is the resident baker among my three children. And 
he does a really good job. He makes these ice cream chocolate chip cookies that are to die for. <laughs> So he, he, he had a knack for baking and he enjoys it. I'm not sure what he enjoys more, the baking process or the consuming, but it was kind of a good place to be for somebody who has an egg allergy, right? Because uh, sometimes pastries and things, baked goods are very much off limit. My middle son came the party food guy. So he would he became expert in making quesadillas. My daughter is the focaccia That's uh, expert, which is a type of bread that we enjoy baking. Make them, make them an expert. And like, let them shine at holiday dinners, like bring, you know, the, let them bring a featured dessert to the, the holiday dinner at a relative or something. So it gives them an opportunity to shine. So, you know, it would make them an expert. I, lo- I love how you said that, make them an expert. Yeah. Uh, Vespers, they have this, so it's kind of like a lemon panna cotta chicken. And then we have gluten-free pasta and they, and, and I don't make it at all. It is their go-to dish. And so like, I'd be like, Hey, make your chicken dish. It's literally known as your chicken dish. Like you said, they're, they're expert in it. And I'm like, well, if they make it that good, why, why should I do it? So there, there comes that ultimate goal that they can feed themselves, but they can feed you as well. <laughs> exactly. Or feed their roommates. I've got, you know, the twins now are in college and they live in apartment situations and they are the resident cooks in the apartment. You'd be surprised at how many of their roommates can't even, <laughs> can't cook, won't cook, don't like to cook. And so they're feeding, feeding roommates, you know, and, and uh, organizing dinners and social gatherings and it's all centered on on the cooking skills so it's really a valuable tool i think when you designate them to become an expert in something it needs to be a food that they really enjoy i actually made a an effort to make sure each of our children knew knows how to make a a homemade marinara sauce being a a family with italian heritage having that marinara sauce it's super easy to make you'll never ever want to buy store-bought sauce again (laughs) As long as you don't, you know, have tomato issues or tomato restrictions, like many, many people do. That was sort of like the one mandatory thing that they all needed to be to master in, in our household. Because you can't be a Rigioni and not know how to make Papa's marinara sauce. You know, I think as you transition into to high school, like letting them invite, like the Friendsgiving idea, that's brilliant. They get more casual, like have, you know, the team buddies over after a game or, or something then. You know, they could prepare the snacks. You know, there's so many easy foods that are kind of tippy toeing towards kitchen independence. Like, how hard is guacamole to make? I mean, you know, peel some avocados, you squeeze some lime juice, you know, chop up some garlic, uh, add some spices if you're into spices, and mash it all up. And there you go. It's very user friendly. So, there's some super easy recipes out there that can give them gradual independence that they can master and build their confidence with. I, I think it's sort of a hindsight is twenty twenty exercise. Like you realize the value after you've gone gone through it and you can see, wow, you know, I muddled my way through, but uh, we're trying to, to help you make it a little more methodical, calculated, <laughs> you know, because if you uh, calculate it instead of muddle your way through, well, you're going to have an amazing cook on your hands when they're, you know, they're in high school and into college. You know, you might even like cycle your high schooler into uh, in a weeknight dinner rotation, you know, have them be responsible for putting the family meal on the table, you know, depending, given their, their schedule and their activities and everything. But, you know, just giving them opportunities to shine and to contribute. Mm-hmm. And no matter what level of cook that you are, yes, I'm a chef that's been chefing for 30 years. So all different levels and you can still empower your children. Don't think that you can't. You can teach your kids how to cook at the same time you're learning how to cook. Yeah. And it also becomes really fun too, because you think about maybe some of the big, you know, events or holidays or milestone celebrations in your life. And so bringing the family together to prepare for guests, or things it's just a beautiful thing in the kitchen when you've got like helping hands who can lighten the load a little bit and and you know help you treat your guests to a to a wonderful meal and a wonderful celebration so you know it doesn't happen it's 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 labor invested it's time intensive in the beginning it's maybe less helpful in the beginning but once they have those skills and you have the habit or the custom of coming together as a family to create something wonderful in the kitchen. 
I mean, you're golden. I mean, it, it becomes kind of that way of life. It just becomes second nature. Like you're just automatically mm-hmm. doing it. it becomes, you know, a team event. And it's really, I know I kind of sound corny saying beautiful, but it really is beautiful to like look back on this experience. So like I said, with levels of cooking, I know you were like, I'm not the biggest chef and uh, allergy forces recipes that we work, we collaborate with. They are like four to five ingredients. Usually they're very easy to make. And that's because everybody's at different levels, but also everybody's really crunched for time. Yeah. When I, I, I have to admit, when I see a recipe with like a gazillion ingredients, <laughs> turn the page, <laughs> look, look further. <laughs> so I, you know, it's, it's got to be kind of easy and not not overwhelming ingredients that I can't pronounce and things like that to um, get, let me give it a try. But I could say like in, in terms of just the kitchen opportunity or trying to instill these skills in your children, like you reach a point where it actually does come full circle. Like I find myself much more comfortable these days being in a sous chef role to, to my kids. You know, I'll do the chopping. I'll do the, the mixing or the whatever, but they lead the charge on, on kind of the creation. And I'm so happy being in a sous chef role. It's so rewarding to come home sometimes and dinner's already been cooked and you just don't have to worry about it. It's just magical. <laughs> it's like, yay! Yeah, well, I wouldn't say we're quite at that point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely deep into collaboration when they're home from college. <laughs> oh, okay, that's where in high school, quite a few times I would come home and, and dinner would be made. Wow, okay. Yeah, I was... Good on you. Vesper also said that they were my sous chef very early on. Like I said, wh- whether you're our, you've been in the kitchen like for 30 years plus like, like, like me or you're a novice cook or you're someone that can get by. I think doesn't that's matter. I fall. I'm someone you're, who you get by. I get by <laughs> with a little sizzle and a little uh, creativity here and there, but I, I do get by. <laughs> Not I know a you <laughs> it does, And that's about, the whole point is you don't have to be, you know, you really don't have to be to still teach your kids how to cook. Is there any other points that you want to really, like, really go over that we haven't approached yet? I actually had kind of this list foods that are super easy to make that could kind of be fun for, for kids to make or gain some independence with, you know, get a sense of accomplishment. So I already talked about the guacamole. One of the easiest recipes, and again, it's for substitutions and things, but there's some pretty good gluten-free flour blends in the marketplace now. But shortbread cookies, usually there's like three ingredients or something in shortbread. They're so easy to make, you know, so that's a, a nice one. And again, it kind of checks my box for not too many ingredients and, and it's not too complicated. Marinara sauce is super easy to make. Quesadillas, pesto sauce, you know, with as long as you have a food processor, super easy to make and you can make it vegan. You can, you know, so there's some wins, quick wins, muffins and quick breads, always few ingredients and something really tasty. Great way to use up bananas that are a day a day too old or something like that, or pumpkin bread, pancakes and waffles. That's a great place to start. Quick to make, so you get that satisfaction of it coming off the griddle. Cream soups are surprisingly easy to make without the cream. You know, you just cook some veggies to death and then puree them. Don't forget the potatoes if you can use potatoes in a recipe because that gives it its creaminess. But there's just so many simple recipes that don't have a lot of ingredients that give a lot of satisfaction with a nice finish. Um, and then, um, Martha, you had amazing recipes, super simple, like cucumber salad or watermelon salad. So easy to make those recipes, right? And they're delicious and they keep well. So there's some like quick start types of recipes that don't don't overwhelm, you know, and are easy for divvying up. And there's also, uh, what was it, the Tuscan bean soup, and that's on Allergy Force as well. So check that out, that recipe. And that one has a video, so it's on my YouTube channel as well. I think that that's a really great list to kind of like start with. So anyway, so those those are my, my ideas. You know, I think uh, start early, make it fun, you know, don't make it a chore and be encouraging, you know, even when there's, there's mistakes. And, um, you know, have fun together. Before you know it, I mean, kids grow up. I mean, you blink your eyes and, oh, my gosh, they're this old already. So before you blink your eyes, I mean, they'll, they'll be, you know, heading off and doing their thing and being much, much more independent. So if you kind of equip them to, to nourish themselves, you did good. You did. You did very good if you got to do that. Well, I guess that about sums it up for this 
episode of Allergy Friends. But thank you so much again, Gail, for coming by and well, not really coming by, virtually coming by and chatting with me for this episode. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And so glad to work with you on this episode. If you all have not checked out Allergy Force the app, please make sure to go ahead and check that out. I'll have that link down below. And uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, please, you know, obviously message us or comment, subscribe, like, and do all that good stuff that you're supposed to do. And we will catch you next time. Bye. Bye.